All right. <clears throat> I have some old business to cover before we get into the new business. And looks like a lot of people are back again. It looks like we're still waiting for a few of them. I'm looking for one person in particular that's not back. But all right. Um, I want to revisit collection agencies from yesterday. And the, uh, oh, that, running back to the, yeah, sure, I understand. Um, I'm going to revisit a couple of these uh, loose ends from last night, and then we're going to move forward into the material again here. I brought up the collection agencies, and um, my wife, you know, you can leave it to my wife, our accountability partner. If you guys don't have a wife <laughs> of, I'll rephrase that. If you are married, and you don't have a relationship that is safe enough with your spouse, your significant other, and if you're not married, if you don't have an accountability partner that is a safe zone for you where anything goes, anything can be said, there is no secrets, there is no darkness, there is no offense, and there is no condemnation. If that does not exist in your life, that's your first assignment. Get out there and get one. And I promise you one thing, if you have that relationship with your spouse, nothing ever will rock your world. Nothing. Satan does not have an in without strife. But where there's strife, confusion, there's every evil work. Not just a little bit. Every. Try to exclude something from every. It ain't going to work. So my wife last night on the phone said, you know, all good. I'm not so sure about your response to the collection agency thing. And... Uh, the whole looking in the camera and giving your phone number, she says a little over the top. Yeah, yeah, I so I apologize. I'm sorry. Um, I, uh, no, not at all. It's all over the internet. Um, no, that uh, she did make those comments, and then she followed through with, you know, she changed the subject quickly to the good things. But uh, the whole phone number thing, I have a thing about collection agencies. And this morning, because of that question of, you know, is it right to counsel a Christian room in which I just got through saying that Christians pay their debts? Is it proper to sit here and tell you to negotiate down debt? So out of curiosity, I woke up at 5.30 this morning, as usual. Testimony yesterday. By yourself. Five, this morning, yeah, I, I called her. So I got up at 5.30 this morning, I got online. I wanted to see what other Christian debt counselors advised on collection agencies. Because I know why I gave my phone number into that camera right there. It's because of my own season in life where collection agencies were... Uh, it seems like every collection agency in America had my phone number, but not a single friend did. And that is a lonely place. That's a really lonely place. So the, uh, the bitterness of my heart from going back 25 years ago, let it go. I won't do that again. But what I came to find... And you can do your own research. Just Google Christian response. I, my, my Google was, in quotation marks, Christian response debt collection. Okay? It's, that, that was the string. And what came up was there were Christian websites that are .org debt Christian counseling sites that actually went to the level of name-calling collection agencies. Name-calling. So I actually took it easy compared to some of these sites. And the council was unanimous 100% across the board. The collection agency has bought your debt for pennies on the dollar, have no idea how old that, that collection, the original collection was, and don't you dare, the two big councils on it, don't you dare, number one, settle for full price. Don't be foolish. And number two, don't ever, ever give them access to do a direct draw from any of your accounts. Okay? You can pay by a check, but do not authorize any direct payments on any of your accounts. So I got validation in my response to you, and it may have been stirred up by another trigger, sort of like that word game. <laughs> <coughs> but uh, uh, my counsel stands, and I feel validated, and I just wanted to retrace those steps from yesterday. All right. Number two, I was asked about student loans. And I want to address student loans because there's more than one of you in here that are dealing with student loans. Or you have kids that are dealing with student loans. Um, student loans are, 
with, with today's cost of tuition, student loans are almost a necessity. I mean, it may almost feel like you have to have a student loan if you want to get a four-year degree, but student loans are still a debt instrument. They still get included in your debt plan. Student loans are still an obligation that need to be paid back. And a private student loan is going to be treated like a mortgage, like any other loan at a bank, because it's a regular lending institution with FDIC regulation that will be audited once a year by bank regulators, and they have got to hold to the same standard of lending as what you would for a car loan or a mortgage whereas a government loan has got options attached to it of being graduated or even forgiven, of being abated in some fashion. And you've got flexibility in repaying a government student loan, whether it's subsidized or unsubsidized. Uh, student loans can get big. I've talked to two individuals, one with 40,000 and one with 50,000 worth of debt upon graduation for just getting a four-year degree. That's a tragedy in my opinion. It really is, because then you graduate and you're expected to make these. The one showed me what the repayment program would look like, and it was staggering. It, his comment, and uh, very real, his comment is, this is bigger than my car payment, and it was. So student loans, um, if you do have kids that are attending college, if you know anyone that's coming into college, uh, like I said, they can't be avoided in most cases. But you can at least give an education as to what we've talked about with interest so that they're not caught off guard upon graduation. Okay? The repayment of a student loan, if you do only the minimums or you do a graduated for a season of years, the result can be catastrophic in the interest charges. Okay? All right. I have a question up here that says, when is bankruptcy okay? You're awesome. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. <laughs> And it works, all right. It wasn't me. <laughs> bankruptcy. When is it OK to file bankruptcy? My goodness. Number one, I'm sorry if you've gotten into the grip of a collection agent where the Christian world feels like it's OK that they can call collection agencies things like bottom dwellers. Um, it should not be. But bankruptcy. Uh, whoever posed that, if it was for somebody in this room, if it was somebody that's beyond this room that you just know or love, uh, make it a last resort. I could never ever counsel anybody in a clear conscience to file bankruptcy because it is so tragic to your credit reporting and to your future. It definitely is a scape route and there are situations if it's a medical bankruptcy or a lawsuit where the Lord, I absolutely believe, especially if it was not just, <clears throat> no medical condition is just. You realize that? Amen. There isn't a single medical condition you can call justice. I could preach on that a long time. There's no medical condition you can call just. There's no lawsuit of the world that is necessarily just. So there's going to be some situations where I'm just going to say it's injustice against you as a person, against your family, against you and your stability, and against you and a child of God. And in those matters of injustice, bankruptcy, I pray with you and believe that the Lord is going to give you peace, but I'm certainly not going to talk you out of it. But just know that the ramifications of filing bankruptcy are going to haunt you for 10 years. The, uh, the bankruptcy credit report is one of the biggest black eyes in financial America. So try to use bankruptcy as an absolute last resort unless there's a contingency to the situation. Uh, there are enough debt programs out there beyond the one that I've been teaching you for the last two days that to get alongside a debt counselor, and to even go alongside one of the fee-based debt counselors that will actually become a referee or mediator on your behalf to talk down the amount of credit that is out there. A creditor would rather settle the debt and purge that from their records, but settle a debt, than to go up against a bankruptcy. So if you've got a $40,000 Visa card, there are agencies out there that are fee-based, small fee-based, but they are fee-based and they will actually go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Capital One, Visa, whoever, and they will renegotiate what is actually owed. They shut the account down and they put you on a payment terms through the, the mediator that then gets disseminated out to the creditors. But they will negotiate down on a settlement for what the total due is. That would be a much better way to go than filing bankruptcy. At least you've tried. At least you have given it a good faith effort. Questions on that? Well, it's not bankruptcy, but what about defaulting like on a car loan? And just giving the car back? Uh -huh. You can do a, a 
give your mortgage back, give the title back. You can do those things, yes, and that is more noble than just simply abandoning the property and letting the bank figure out you're not going to make your payments anymore. Definitely far more noble, yes, and there is a name for that when you take your title or deed back. Thank you. This guy has stepped to the plate so many times. He's only been here for 24 hours. So he said it's all a short sell. Um, you can't sell your home. You're underwater on the home. Uh, uh, it may be an option. And actually, one of these evaluations came up here, and I don't know who it is, and this is an offense, but it came up here and said, less personal stories. I came down here with the instruction that says that my testimony is my credibility. I cannot honor that. I can't. I'm sorry. I've got to give personal stories to be obedient to the Lord. My wife did exactly that same thing. She just simply went into the bank in a small town in lower Michigan. Uh, it was a uh, situation where um, the testimony of how my wife and I met, if I had the time, my goodness, I could. The Lord, the Lord is so good. If you can leave this door and just know that with all of your heart, how good the Lord is, you have had a victory that will last eternity. If that's all you got. All right. So my wife, I'll just go there. Should we just go there? This is financially based, but it is also so stirring. All right. My wife, Elaine and Grace, the two oldest ones, she's married. Okay? She has Elaine and Grace. They're living in a, lower, uh, in a little town in lower Michigan. And uh, her husband got in trouble. And he went away to prison for two years. And the Lord told her, don't leave him. Don't leave him. But now she's alone, single income, actually homeschooling, no income. And uh, uh, her testimony there, when I said that I lost my job, but my wife had more experience, she was more seasoned with... Uh, the goodness of God and his benevolence and his blessing than I was, that she said, let's still go to Green Bay and go shopping? It was from this season. My wife was seasoned. And she learned it through a hardship, but it was not her choice that she was in that hardship. She would go to church, and she would come out of church, and in her meal slot of her large church, United Brethren Church, not even full gospel, there'd be envelopes, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, that when she married me, no income. I am going to say it again. There was no source of income except who became her husband. Who became her provider? Our good God. She married me with $4,000 cash. She didn't need it. That's our God. All right. Let me back up again. So he gets out. Didn't last long. He reoffended. Went back in. The second time he went back in, the Lord said, you're good. You're done. I release you from this marriage, from this covenant. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, she just moved. She left. Two offenses, the same small town. The town can't be more than 2,000 people. She left. And uh, she walked into the bank. She cleaned that house top to bottom, made it as perfect as she possibly could, better than what it was when she moved in, gave the bank the title, the bank called her two weeks later and said, I just want you to know, we have never, ever experienced in all our years what you just did for us. Your house is in better condition than most homes that we ever see a second time. That's stewardship. Amen. That's stewardship. Okay? So, this is God. And in great humility and in great testimony, Troy the name of her first husband, goes to prison. And I, through my own series of choices, when I was uh, 20, the first time 21, I started my own entanglements with the law. And boy, did I go in deep, real deep. I became a three-time loser. I did three and a half years. So what you're looking at is a product of the Michigan Correctional Facility of three and a half years that I sat in prison Guess how long I've been out with where I'm at right now today? 12 years. 12 years. $200,000 of debt's going to be wiped out in just a matter of a couple of years. I'm standing in front of you as an ordained pastor. Amen. Amen. Should I go further? Yeah. Okay. How about this one? How about this one? 
I, uh, I'm a cop. Remember I told you I had a law degree? Yes. I'm a cop in Minnesota, and I'm dealing crack cocaine in the jail. That didn't go over so good. <laughs> that was when I was 21. I, uh, um, Randy and I kind of have had some similar, uh, yeah. I would be on his client's side, you know? All right, so that was at the age of 21. I am the son of a pastor, okay? I grew up in the Lutheran church body, and uh, my salvation message is on my third strike, which also didn't go over so good, the state of Minnesota. Um, I'm on suicide watch. I had been suicidal most of my childhood. I owned a motorcycle for the sheer purpose that I thought that was the easiest way to pull the trigger. Just find some dump truck rolling down the road at 60 miles an hour and just swerve. So, I mean, I was in a pit. I, I was full of addictions. I, I was, there was no light when I looked up. So, I, uh, I'm on suicide watch in a fishbowl, literally a plexiglass cell with a camera on me. And uh, the jail chaplain comes walking through. And all I've got is my little food tray. That's the only civilization I have is any activity I see walk down the hallway is this food tray. So... Jerry comes to that tray, and he puts his head down in the hole, and he says, Hi, I'm Jerry, the jail chaplain. Do you know God? <laughs> and I looked through the hole, and I said, I know of God, but I certainly don't know him. I'm a pastor's kid. I was on the church council. I was the youth leader. I was in the choir. I was the secretary, the treasurer of the church. I was doing all the good boy things. I was going to church, and I was hearing the word every single Sunday. But you know what? I was a heathen destined for hell every day of my living days until I was 32 years old. So at the age of 32 is when this gentleman comes to the door. And uh, oh, I was confirmed. I was a good church boy. Man, I was good. I was doing everything right. I was a shining star in the Lutheran church, man. So, did not know I was going to go here this afternoon. So he put the Bible through the lunch tray, and he said, I'm going to give you a Bible, and I'll come back and see you in the morning. I'm like, Whatever. I just sat there, and I came up with 101 ways of how you can actually kill yourself in jail. That's how I spent my night. I could have written a book on the 101 ways. And uh, the next morning, in the system, you gotta, they, you got to keep a tight area. It's got to be neat. And so I had to make my bunk. And uh, I went to make my bed, and I kicked. I had taken that Bible, and I, I thought that I chucked that thing so hard it would have torn the cover off. I threw it underneath my bed so hard. I was so angry. Just livid at myself. I had nobody else to blame. And uh, that Bible only went under the bed about six inches, even though I <laughs> bolded underneath there. And as I'm making my bed, I kicked it. And I sat down on my bunk. And I reached down, and I grabbed it. And so I'm sitting here looking. I, I still see that cover as if it were sitting right here in front of me right now. Soft card NIV Bible. The tiniest print. I'm holding it between my legs, sitting on the bunk. And out loud, on microphone and in front of camera on suicide watch, I said, God, if there's anything you can do with this life, you better show me right now. And I just, in anger, I just ripped that Bible open. And my eyes went straight to Jeremiah 29, 11. Did not know that verse was in the Bible. Had no idea it existed. Lutheran Old Testament. I know the plans I have for you. The plans to prosper you. Plans to give you a hope and a future yeah. of good, not evil. Yes. The tears started. I think two hours passed. I just sat there talking to the Father. I had never prayed in my life, not a day. By the time I stood up off that bunk, I was free. I was free. The alcoholism, Pornography, everything. I just stood up. 
I knew I had a natural consequence to face. I knew there was no chance I was staying at the county level. No chance. I was going to go to the big house. But I did it with God this time. If you want to know why I'm so passionate about what I do and why I harp on you about freedom, why I look you all in the eyes and say, I don't care where you're at. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've come from. There is nothing but vertical motion ahead of you. There's only one direction you can go as long as you keep doing stuff like this. So I'm going to wrap this up by coming back to where I started. My wife had a two-time offender as her husband. So I go to prison. Guess who I become good friends with without knowing who I'm talking to? I mean, we are talking good friends. Good friends. Troy. Troy became a buddy. We did 14 months together. We were on the church deacon board for the Full Gospel Church. You can't make this up. You can't make this up. This is better than the Bolton story. Um, we were on the church deacon board in the prison, and if you want some insight on our prison system, there's a fire burning in our prison system that our church could really catch ignition from. There is a lot going on behind the walls. So... Uh, he and I became good friends, and uh, this was I got I, I just got to back up, make sure I get my timeline right. We became good friends, and then he paroled. When he went home is when the reoffense came. Okay, just so we've got this timeline set. So I'm still sitting in, and Troy is out, and he's back with Allison. But then he reoffended. Okay, so now Allison hears the Lord say you're released from your covenant. She divorces, and now I paroled shortly after that. Now he's back in, and I'm getting out. Okay, so the only people that stayed at my side while I was in were my mom and dad. Even though I lived a life that was so hateful, and I won't even begin to go to the hurt that I created for them. Um, they drove to come see me regularly about every six weeks, and we kept a pretty close relationship. It was in prison that I got saved, and then it was in prison that I got excommunicated by my dad because I got alongside the full gospel brethren in the prison, and that's a whole other testimony by itself. But the Lord took good care of me, and I got delivered and baptized in the Holy Ghost behind the wall. I got free while being captive. So now I'm out, and I parole out, and uh, I'm on the phone with my mom, and in one of our visits, my mom is, she's just cute in the way that she tries to play matchmaker. We're sitting in one of my last visits before I'm about to parole, and she said, oh, Steve, if you could just get out and marry somebody like Allison, my wife. Those were my mom, that was my mom's prophecy, even though she had no idea what she was saying. So I get out, and my mom tells Allison, now that she's alone, she said, I know that Steve is still on parole, but I do believe he understands where you come from. He was friends with the ex while behind the walls. Maybe we should call Steve. So we started doing Bible studies together. She would call me up, and we would sit and pray and do Bible studies together. And one thing led to another, that her divorce became final, and I came off of parole. And uh, we both very much, with fasting and prayer, she's in Bloomington, Illinois. I'm up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. We spent hours on our face before the Lord as to what he was doing here. And I didn't so much as propose to Allison as much as the Lord just simply said, this is meant to be. And so we married. It's been 11 years now. And I, just because I did time and paid a price 
just because I got delivered, just because I got full of the Holy Ghost, and just because I'm really, really, really getting to know my father as a protector because of the way how easily I was able to get through prison, and then how things fell in place while I was on parole, and then I told you the testimony of how we got our house, and I'm telling you how well he took care of me because she, he provided me with a beautiful wife, even though I'm an ex-con, just still on parole for the most part, and brings me in a family, brings me a career, puts me into a beautiful home, even with all of that goodness going on around me, can you imagine that my heart had still not humbled itself to truly, absolutely sell myself out to the Lord? You should all be able to imagine that. All right, that was a rhetorical question. Okay? The anger, the habits... I was not an easy man to be married to, even though the Lord said, this is your guy. Because we knew, we knew we were to be together. It didn't make me just a clean vessel fit for the master's use. I told you the prophecy 12 years ago that said your platforms wait for it, and if you don't find it through obedience, that you're going to burn up from the inside out. It took me 12 years. It took me 12 years. We read in Matthew 18, don't quote me on that, we read about a woman that was bent over for 18 years, bent over at the back, not able to stand up. We read about Jesus saying, I only do what I see the Father doing. I only say what I hear the Father saying. And we read about Jesus telling his disciples, this woman has been bound up for 18 long years. 18 long years. Jesus is able to identify with our weaknesses and he knows our suffering. He became in the flesh as we are. He relates to us. Jesus himself said this woman was bound up for 18 long, not just 18 years, 18 years would have sufficed. We would have all known what that meant. He threw that long in there. He gave us an extra adjective to understand, I get it. I get it. 18 years. I stayed bound up for 12 before I got my platform. When is long enough for you? When is it today, is this day, the scripture fulfilled in your presence? When does that day come for you? Yesterday there was an anointing that entered into this room. I'm telling you what, people. If your eyes were open, you were able to see what was going on in here. God showed up. And I'm sitting in my room this morning. And I love y'all. And you're here because you are being obedient to the call of the Holy Spirit. But the Lord this morning gives me a very clear, firm instruction. Slow down. Go back over some of these slides. They're not getting it. They're taking in a lot of information, but they didn't hear you on the first night. You said, be expecting. All they're doing is listening. Where's the expecting? Why are you only listening? Is it because so Monday morning you can just go back to the same bondage? the long years of bondage? Or do you want to start expecting? There is so much the church is, is... Let me put it this way. There is so much that the church is missing. It's flat out by its own choice missing. So the Lord says, greatness is in this room. You want to revive the I-380 corridor? You don't need anything more. You get a room full of broken people that are hungry for the Lord, that are coming forward and saying, educate me so that I can live a better life, that I can get myself out of bondage, that I can live for Jesus, that I can unite with my fellow brethren. The favor of the Lord hits his place. He brings the increase in. And all of a sudden, we need every one of you to be rising up as leadership within the church because we can't handle the numbers. Why do you think you're sitting here? You're chosen. You're sanctified. You're set apart. You're special. The Lord calls you great. Step into it. Stand up out of your bondage and stay there. Not another inch. Take your stand. And after having done all, stand. That's who I am. So the other half of three degrees ministry, guess what? He went and ministered in the prison, so did I. 
He was able to go home, though. I didn't go home so quick. But I learned church leadership in the walls. That's where I learned church leadership. He not only put me in a prison, he had his choice of 40 prisons he could have put me in, the Lord. He put me in the one prison in the entire state that had a full gospel chaplain. Spoke in tongues and danced the storm when he preached. I got the one. I got the one. All right. So let me give you a real life lesson to put the capstone on all of this. Why can I fairly stand in front of you and say, if you don't hear what I'm saying in five years' time, you're going to be worse off than you are today? Why am I able to say that? Go do a history on lottery winners. Pull up a news article as to what happened to the latest 20 Powerball winners and where they're at. Half of them are in prison. They're all divorced. They're broke. Why? Remember yesterday I read you the verse that said I'm only going to give it to you little by little? Yeah, little by little. They were given a landslide. They didn't know how to handle it. They could not occupy what they had been given. Can you occupy the next four people that walk through the door? Absolutely. You guys are equipped. After this weekend, absolutely. What about the four after that and the four after that and the four after that? All of a sudden they start coming so fast your classes can't keep up. All of a sudden, they're coming so fast, you no longer know the name of everybody you're in church with. Everybody, all, enough come through the door, and all of a sudden, now you're looking at a building project. Do you know what that can do to a church that's not united? Yeah. Quick. I want those cabinets, but I want those cabinets, and boy, that carpet's got to go. Can you imagine a church split over carpeting? Yes. Yeah. All right. So I have dumped a lot of stuff in your laps. And I am doing it with my own passion. I am doing it not only because the prophet of God called it out over my life, not because I, I love the body and I love ministers and I want to be a pastor to pastors, but I'm doing it because I've been here. I've been in the broken place. I know what it feels like. There is not a single story in this room that would make my eyebrows go up. I may reply to the injustice that's in this room and what's been done or what's happened, but not to the story or the situation. It always has a way out. It always involves God. And it always involves you making a step. Always. So I have a note written here also of the Lord this morning of... It just simply says, not recall. Just a reminder that Pastor Tommy, because you guys have been blessed with the technology, I actually kind of enjoyed watching myself. I had never had the opportunity to be recorded before, so that first night I stayed up to midnight watching myself preach to myself. It was not an ego thing. It was, I want to see my mannerisms. I want to hear the inflection of my voice. I want to know if I'm just a dead <laughs> voice standing up here. And actually, I watched the worst one because that first night is when I'm coming in here and the identity of the problem is taking place, which is so dry and is so heavy that that was a horrible night. But if I thought I did okay on that night, I didn't have to watch anymore after that. So we've got these videos. And however Pastor Tommy wants to set up with these videos, if there's, if there's access that's given to you in any way, sort, or form, you are not going to remember what was just dumped on you in these last three days. But God will honor your faithfulness if you go back and rewatch. Go back and rewatch and watch them with your notes in front of you so that the next time you watch this, you're not word busy writing, but you're actually able to enjoy and hear with your ears, involve your senses, and get it in your spirit and be disciplined to follow through. Amen. All right. I'm going to hand out, when my 18 year old on the night before I came down here laid her hands on me and said, Lord, we believe in his ministry and we send him with our blessing. She had gone through my slideshow, and she stopped, bluntly stopped on one particular slide, and it is a slide that I actually blew through because I didn't have peace in approaching it yet. I actually skipped the bullet altogether. How many times have I skipped bullets in here? That was the one. So I uh, came out of prison, 
And by the way, whoever's evaluation came up here and was asking for more budget sheets because they didn't get enough, there's a whole pile up here. Help yourself. Um, I wrote this, but in reality, the Holy Spirit wrote this, and I just simply hand it out because it is, if you get this, you win. I'm going to do a Randy. I can't laugh like him. I don't want to embarrass him by trying to pretend I know how to laugh like him. All right. Pray this with me. And if you're praying it with a spouse or a loved one, change, change every single first-person pronoun to we or our instead and make it plural. Pray this with me. I'm not going to be able to. I have to keep my eyes open. I don't have it memorized. It's too long. It says, I kneel before the Father of my Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of your glorious riches you may strengthen me with power through your spirit in my inner being, so that Christ may dwell in my heart through faith, that I, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that I may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, that I might be filled with the knowledge of your will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding, that we may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that we may have great endurance and patience. God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, I pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that I may know you better. I pray also that the eyes of my heart may be enlightened, in order that I may know the hope to which you have called me, the riches of your glorious inheritance in the saints, and your incomparably great power toward me who believes. That power is like the working of your mighty strength, which you exerted in Christ when you raised him from the dead and seated him at your right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one that is to come. And you placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And I am confident of this, that he who began a good work in me will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. And this is my prayer that my love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that I may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I give thanks to the Father who has qualified me, God qualified me, who has qualified me to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued me from the dominion of darkness and brought me into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom I have redemption, the complete, entire, and absolute forgiveness of sins. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all I could ask or think, according to his power that is at work in me, to him be the glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus, through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. What did I do here? Whew, I'm lightheaded. What did I do? There's four Pauline prayers. What did I do to those prayers? First person. First person. You want to make God's word live in your life? You want to come alive in your spirit? I call this the prayer for revelation. And there's no ownership of this prayer because this prayer belongs to God. You may hand this out at will and put it at the local mall if you wanted to. But I'm going to hand these out to each one of you. And of this whole coursework, you want to know what stood out to my 18-year-old? This power. The power of these words. Did she say you didn't mention that? Pardon? Did she say you didn't mention that? What did she, how did it stand out to you? That I've got on a slide. I've got a bullet point for myself, prayer for revelation, and I skipped it two nights ago. How am I doing? Fantastic. Two thumbs, not just one, two. 
All right, here's another handout that I skipped. I brought handouts. I just wasn't getting to them. I was yapping too much. This is simply titled, How to Live Debt-Free. It's just a very short, bullet point, scripture-filled handout of when you feel weak, you want to abandon the budget, you want to quit, you want to give up, just a quick reference. You can look great next to all the grandkids on the refrigerator, wouldn't it? All right. It was right here. I walked in this room and I got starting to talking and whew, the Lord said, no, I knew I was going to come here and share my testimony. I just didn't know when. And I actually sat in bed last night thinking, golly, there's one day left. I guess not. I heard wrong. <laughs> Living color. <laughs> I've got some life experiences. And I'm not the only one. We all have a story. The first night when I said your story may be the very thing that the next person needs in this room. Guess what? This is such an awesome family in here. You know what I've noticed in here, what I've picked up, the vibe in here? Loyalty. There is a level of loyalty of this body of believers towards one another and to your shepherds that I think a lot of pastors should covet. And that's a congratulations to you. been a pleasure of people. All right. I left you hanging on starting a business, but you know what? I'm going to leave you hanging again. <laughs> <sighs> and these are advanced to the next slide after starting a business here. Um, if you've got the, the new, I wrote five new slides this morning. Do you have the new program? Uh, yeah. that one? Uh, there we go. Yep. Put that one up. All right. So I had firm instructions that I'm supposed to come down here and say something about tithes. And to be honest, I told my wife this morning that, uh, so what could I possibly have to say about tithes that they haven't already heard? These are full gospel runners. They are people that are running with the best of the best and listening to their messages. They can YouTube tithes anytime they want to. And yet the Lord still said, say something about the tithe. Evidently, you have ears to hear, and if you've listened to 100 messages about the tithe before this, today you're going to hear it. Okay? All right. Tithes. And I'm going to go through some of these pretty quickly, because these first ones are just definitions that I'm assuming most of you, everybody in this room knows, and I'm going to give credit to where credit is due, and that's for those that are walking the fivefold in the KCM circles. Um, that's where I got my education from the likes of Jesse Duplantis, Jerry Savell, Kenneth, and the others. So 10% given to God in obedience is the tithe. Did you know, first of all, there were four ways of giving in the Bible? Is that new ground for anybody in this room? Tithes, offerings, seed, first fruits? Anybody not familiar with these terms? Okay, that's good. Awesome. So the Lord rebukes the devourer and opens the window of heaven. Tithing promises a spiritual response, but you have the choice. Tithing comes with a promise of a spiritual response for that obedience, but you have the choice of being a tither or not. When you put a tithe in a basket, that 10%, ask the Lord to open your eyes and see the immediate, spiritual, angelic, heavenly response of the windows of heaven opening and the devourer being rebuked. That is the response of a tithe. If that doesn't make you excited for the next opportunity to tithe, I don't know what to do for you. But there is a spiritual response for when you put the tithe into the church. The Lord rebukes the devourer and opens the windows of heaven. Malachi 3 probably some of the most preached on scripture in the Christian church. But you ask, how are we to return? That's where I started you two nights ago. How are we to return? And I pray that I've done a good job at telling you the various ways in which you begin the return journey or how you continue the journey you've already begun prior to coming here. Will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You're under a curse, the whole nation, because you're robbing me. You're under a curse. It's right there. It's your choice. It's your choice because of you. 
Because of you, you're under a curse. You have allowed Satan into your territory, behind your fence, under your hedge, through every hole and orifice that's available, through the fence that's built around your property, your family, and your goods, and your ministry, and everything you put your hand to. Some of my favorite verses in the Old Testament. Bring the whole tithe, 10%. That's all I'm asking for, 10%. I've given you 100%. Give back my 10 That there may be food in my house. That we may build a building. That we may do the next outreach program. That our pastors are not living check to check. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. Test me. God of the universe is asking me to test him. Other translations, prove me in this. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. I will promise. Every time you see well, will and shall. Every time you read will and shall in the Bible, what does it signify? A promise. How many are there? From Genesis to Revelation, how many of those shells and wills of the Lord exist? I'm hearing various numbers in here, but anybody that said 7,000, I think I heard it over here, there are 7,000 promises that I've quoted the verse already saying that every promise of the Bible in Jesus is yes. Here's a promise. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops. And the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land. Are you living in a delightful land? Is your land delightful? Just start saying yes to that. Just start saying yes to that. When you start going sideways on the holler, don't scream, I'm done. I'm a delightful land. When it warms up, yeah. <laughs> All right, first fruits. Just quickly here. Proverbs 3, 8, and 9. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of your increase. Let your barns will be filled with plenty. There's another promise. Your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. How about a checkbook that overflows with new cash? Amen. Based on increase and added blessings. The first fruits is coming from increase and added blessings in your life. I would call them the suddenlies. Demand a first fruit. Why? So that you can get it again. So that you can prove that you're not married to money and that money has no power over you. So that you can prove that when I get these extras, I'm not like, whoa, I can pay another minimum. Lord, I'm grateful for the increase. I'm grateful for the first fruits and to show you that this money I know is from you and that I know you're not going to stop giving it to me. It's coming right back to you. Amen. Alms, charitable giving. I have an awesome testimony. I am not pointing names. I am going to allow you to look at any of you. But there's an individual that is attending this class that came and talked to me privately. And he admitted to me in great humility that he's going backwards each month. Why? Because he's giving the extra away. And he said, what do I do? He said, I'm giving too much away. That blessed me. What can he expect back? I'm going to jump right down to Proverbs 19, 17. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what he has been given. Reimbursement, right? Amen. Giving done to those that are in need, but according to Matthew 6, you do it secretly or in quietly in order to protect the recipient. You do your alms in secret. Mm-hmm. Offerings. Here's where it gets exciting. The tithe is exciting, mm-hmm. but the seed is promoting. Right. The seed sown in faith produces the 30, 60, and 100-fold harvest And the seed starts, I love that from Jesse Duplantis. That line, I had to put it in there. That's a direct quote of Jesse Duplantis. The seed starts at 11%. The seed starts at 11%. Surest way out of poverty and quickest route to debt cancellation. Because here's where the 30, 60, and 100-fold increase can come from. Offerings create your future, and the seed has to be planted in fertile ground. Don't just throw a check at a church and then claim 100-fold on it. What is their fruit? 
does it stink and look wormy? Or does it look tantalizing and yummy? What's their fruit? Back to Malachi 3. God is not condemning in these verses. He is doing what is always his heart, trying to get something to us. Do you see that in Malachi 3? That he's not condemning them, but he's rather trying to change their vision, what they see, and their attitude of hearts so that he can get something to them? When God asks us to do something, it's not that so he may, excuse me, when God asks us to do something, it is so that he may bless us. In Malachi, the people, their choice, more specifically, was holding God's hand back and limiting his promise. They were giving the devil access to their finances and their efforts. They were giving the devil access. Tithing allows God to intervene on our behalf. The book of Job I've said it already in this conference, but the book of Job in the Old Testament is one of my favorites. There is just such a richness. Everything from getting an inside view to what the courtroom case of justice looks like at the throne of God between Satan and and, and God, all the way to the hedge that was around. Of course he loves you. Look at the hedge you built around. Who built the hedge? God did. What does tithing do? It's your fence. Tithing allows God to intervene on our behalf. We usually don't see what the devil is up to until it's too late. I've said that already. Tithing allows God to get proactive against the devil before he succeeds. And how awesome was that to say that God is proactive on my behalf even though I can't see what's going on. God is already working proactively to avoid the next disaster coming in my life. That Satan had planned for evil as a weapon against me, but he's already been defeated. We should all be enjoying the benefit of the tithe. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I would hope that everybody in here can say that they have testimonies of benefits of the tithe. We do our part and God will do his. He will hedge or fence us in, Deuteronomy 28. And then just some challenging questions here for you. Deuteronomy 28, the blessings and the cursings, probably some very familiar passages to you, but I ask you, according to Deuteronomy 28, what are you putting your hand to Or, what has God shown you you should put your hand to? And then at the same time, I can ask this. What do you have behind your fence? Or is what has God asked you to have available behind your fence? What are you putting your hand to? What has God shown you should be in your fence? And what's already in your fence? Has God asked you to expand your boundaries? Has God asked you to put a few more links in your fence and widen it out a little bit because he's got more for you? If he's got nothing to work with, if he's got nothing to work with, okay, I'll just say it. Get into prayer and find out what you're missing. Offer him something to work with. Tithing is a privilege given to us to be done in a spiritual spirit of worship, gratitude, and faith, and just that closing line of respect the tithe. When your pastor calls for a tithe, how else can you say it? Don't pay a bill. Think of these things and meditate over your tithe when you put it in the basket. Exponentially, my story ends by saying that exponentially, in the last three years since I met Gary Cassie, since BVOVN went online and I had preaching in my living room. Remember, we don't have TV? I have a TV, but we don't have TV. I have a TV hooked up to a Roku that even though there's 8,000 channels available on the Roku, we listen to pretty much one, BVOVN, playing through the day in the living room broadcasting, and without any other media in the house, everybody hears it. We all live on one level. We have bedrooms in the basement, but we live on one level for homeschooling and for supervision of the little ones. When we started listening to that and understanding the power of the promise, the promises in the Bible, the power of the tithe, claiming your seed, exponentially, our lives flipped. My income is plenty. 
when I said that industry pays my way to come here, I'm not asking for a thing. I don't need to. And the Lord's ordained it that way. Amen. That's tithing. I said we were going to hit tithing. We just did. Amen. That might have been the quick version, but any questions there? All right. I went pretty fast last night, and the Lord told me to be slowing down and to make a review of some of the older slides, which uh, we're going to have to make time for to be obedient, but it's 3 o'clock already. Self-employment. Let's see if we can holler out 10 things that stood out from last night's lecture about self-employment and what you remember. What stood out to you? Oh, wait a minute. Let me... Uh, there, get off those slides. Passion. Freedom. Freedom. Awesome benefits package. Yeah, your deductibles. The, de the, the expenses, the write-offs. Yeah. 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 All right, what else? Commitment. Commitment? I found the clip. <laughs> it wasn't over there. You were wrong. The kids 21 and younger. The 20, okay, using your children as your help and having that tax write-off. Four more. You guys are doing great. Yeah, please. I, I, it's the strengthening of a commitment between a father and a daughter, my holy, my holy father and me. Oh, do I have a testimony about that? Yeah. Oh, I got a powerful testimony about that, a father-son combination that's self-employed and they're doing fantastic in their first year. I've been consulting with them. Uh, what else? The, the structuring, yeah. how you can structure. Yep, that's the whole structure thing, and I just lost my presentation on that side. Okay. Um, can we get two more? There were plenty. You gave several web pages for I did, but how about this first one? We're on number nine. We have one left. I would love to know that we could plug that one in somewhere. Didn't we just have an amazing object lesson this morning about this? You may hear about this from the pulpit again. Yep. Yeah, how about getting God involved? All right. All right. The vision, the business plan, we hit that pretty good last night. I think I can kind of... Uh, get to this last slide. All right, a good business plan, though the task may feel daunting, will reveal required information and facts needed for success. Don't look at a business plan as being a secular tool. A business plan was invented by the world, but my goodness, call your business plan a five to 30 page vision board because it is your vision. And I pray that the Lord has got his own handwriting in that business plan. If you want success, you will take the time and write a business plan even if you don't need a bank. It is your vision. It is what you refer to when things go off track. It's what you refer to when you all of a sudden get a witty idea of branching out and you go back to the plan and you first of all ask God to make sure that he opens your eyes to understand, but number two, you look at your plan and see if it fits. See if the original plan works. What are you throwing in me now? Oh my goodness. That's great, but I'm not going to go there. Yeah, that's a, he's got a whole other approach to opening business. See Brandy privately for business consulting services gratis as soon as we're done here. Okay? <laughs> You're great. <laughs> Stop it. All right. A good plan. Peace is present. Your spouse is in agreement. All right, a good plan. You've done your homework. Peace is present. God is involved. Your spouse is in agreement, okay? That is not far behind the first one of making sure God is in place. And startup resources available. You know what you need to get going, and you've got them available, and they're ready to move with you. Do it. Don't, don't, don't wait or stop for anything. Don't make any more excuses. Just do it. If you've got these things in place, if this exists in the whole business venture, 
There's nothing more that needs done. You just go, okay? Consult with an accountant and insurance agency to protect yourself. I cannot stress that one enough. My disclaimer of this coursework is simply this. I am not a CPA, nor am I a licensed broker of any kind that can deal with insurance or securities in any way, sort, or form. I can't sell you a thing, nor can I file anything on your behalf without power of attorney. I don't have a license. What I'm coming in here with is business experience and a lot of education and a lot of learning through the hard tricks of business and money and church, ministry, okay? Consult with an accountant and insurance agency to protect yourself. I can take you to a certain place of a good plan and I can audit insurance and I can look at tax returns and I can talk about what are options for retirement but then I will stop and I'll say you're at the point now of making some phone calls and finding something that suits your need. I will pass you off to the professionals. If that's an attorney, a CPA, or a uh, uh, CPA and accountant is the same thing, or the insurance agency, whichever it is, there are paid professionals out there that will take over at some time. There will be a handoff. And it has to be that way. Number one, these people should be local and people you know, not somebody that's traveling and 400 miles away. Okay? Don't judge the small beginnings. And then I even have written here now, lottery winners. Small beginnings are healthy. Small beginnings are good. Now, if you come up with a product where the business really does become vibrant from day one and takes off on its own, that's great. I have two businesses locally right now that I'm working with very closely as a CFO and as an operations manager position, oversight with employees and all operations. One of them is a coffee house cafe. The other one is a construction company. The construction company, when I started three and a half years ago, I told you, was at $350,000 gross profit, had two employees and one subcontractor that was willing to work for him. So there was a total of the owner, plus two, plus one, four people, $350,000. They ran one, maybe two jobs at a time. That company, after 30 months, is now up to four and five crews. I'm going to call it five, even though we really are finding that managing four with the number we have is enough that we actually need to hire some more. And we tipped $3 million last year after two and a half years in business. That individual business owner was like the frog in the boiling pot. He was able to sit there and stew for 30 months and to learn and mature in business of what it meant to have five crews and 16 employees working for him, doing the juggle of all the extra overhead and all the extra purchasing that needed done to keep the jobs running smoothly together. He was seasoned for 30 months. Let's jump to the coffee house owner. Can you open a restaurant with one person? What did this business owner have to face? Immediate consequences of full business ownership with a gamut of 16 employees before the door even opened. Trained and ready to go with full payroll during the training period before the doors even opened and there was any income at all. Two very different things. Small beginnings are healthy. The small beginnings allow you stretch marks. I know women, you hate that word, I'm sorry. But we are so grateful for you. The lottery winner does not have the luxury of getting stretched or learning what it means to occupy or learning what it means to figure out what their capacity is. A lottery winner simply is dumped a gift in the lap without any more maturity than they had the day before. Paycheck to paycheck and no responsibility with money. Okay? Small beginnings are okay. So we have entrepreneurs in this room. I know of several. They've come and talked to me already, and some of you are destined for that direction. Starting at home with just you, sole proprietorship or a small LLC, there's nothing to be embarrassed about about that. Launch, become known, and once you've got your hands on the, the activity, on the, you're grasping what you've got, move. Now you grow, and you do it with God. Temporary debt if needed. All right, now that has got to be a typo. How does the debt guy stand up here after three days and now say temporary debt if needed? The word temporary is the key. As you are working on this debt freedom, there is now therefore no condemnation. 
We cannot say that enough times because you know what the devil's going to do? Your car breaks down and you've just listened to a seminar where you have vowed to the Lord that you are going debt-free and you're going to take every single step required to get to that point and now you're without transportation. Temporary debt. Get your needs met. You need transportation? Go get a car. If you need to borrow, borrow. You want to open a business, you need a small line of credit to get going, go get your line of credit. Get your marketing going, get the equipment you need to start writing your plans, and get yourself marketed with some neat brochures in the proper places and watch what the Lord does with you. He will not give his glory to another. That prophecy stands over you. He will not give his glory to another. The temporary debt means you've put it into your debt plan. The temporary debt means that it's become part of your aggressive repayment plan and that it fits within your budget. You're not going to go in the hole every month because you've taken a small loan. Temporary debt means that you've bought a vehicle, per se, and the payments that you have committed to fit in your debt plan. They fit in your budget without affecting the family or affecting the lifestyle or making your budget go backwards. Do you understand temporary debt? Paid off usually quickly because it's part of the debt plan. Make it a priority on the debt plan. Move everything forward this way and put the debt plan in first. We're going to revisit that chart because there's some new faces in here and the Lord said to absolutely review that. We're going to hit that one again. I'm going to go over it one more time. <clears throat> Stick to the plan. Could not say that enough. And do the prep work. We were created to succeed. You are not allowed at any point in time to jump three steps in front of God, fail, and then blame God. You're not allowed. You want to jump in front of God and fail? Go look in a mirror. There's only one person to blame. Yikes. Any questions on self-employment? That is really all I allowed time for for self-employment, even though I could do another day, and I would enjoy it. Are you satisfied? You're the hungry one. Oh boy, catch me after. I can see it in your face. <laughs> Let's not even go there right now. All right, jumping back. For the individual on the other computer, we're going to come back here. No, you know what? You can go down there if you want. Sorry. I am going to where the Lord started my day today. Oh, aren't they beautiful? I'm sorry. I just got to boast on them. And you know what my wife did this morning? Pastor Randy is just ripping up a storm in here, and he has just got us all going, and we got two pastors up here trying to figure out what in the world this chart stands for. And I get a text, and it's my wife. And she sends me a picture and says, by the way, I like this one better than the one you're using. I, and I wrote back, and I said, but I'm not in this one. And she wrote back and she said, they can see you. <laughs> I... <laughs> All right. Third time the charm. Children of the living God, sons and daughters of the king, kings and priests with Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. Be expecting. Be expecting. You get four more hours with accountability in the room with you. You get four more hours of the edification verbally lecturing you. Then you've got each other. Okay? We're available. We'll be back. You guys are the priority. You're number one. We'll rearrange schedules if we have to. We're here, but we are still 400 miles away. Okay? This conference does not stop. Okay, other computer, keep up.
Where was I? Budgets. Restructuring is where I'm aiming for, and it was back. I went past it. Yep. All right. Restructured debt. It's, it's just before all of the... Uh, you beat me there? Yeah. You're good. All right. Restructuring. I'm hitting this one again because there are people in this room that weren't getting it, and this is going to be the resource that's going to turn your life around. This is going to be the one. Yes, sir. Can I add something? Those, for those of you that might be watching on your phones, this thing is crystal clear on YouTube, much clearer than what you can see it here. I mean, all the charts, all the graphs are showing up just like you would expect them in here. So go back and watch this stuff. It's really there. Okay. Clear. Amen. And Pastor Randy here is going home with a homework assignment. Now, I think we're up to seven evaluations that came back asking for his stuff to be on slides. So there's another presentation coming into your hands soon. All right. <clears throat> and if, if you don't have it, the time or the resources to do so, I want you to know the Lord is very, very good. This gentleman right here is the new Three Degrees Webmaster. He's taking it over. And uh, the Lord connected us yesterday as we were zippering. I couldn't resist. <laughs> Zippering. I have never, ever, I never have heard that. All right. We love you, Randy. All right. Restructuring debt. There are those in this room that this is going to be your way out. And it's going to be patience in order to research where you're going to go. <sighs> Brick and mortar banks. I had somebody ask me, where would you go for banking? And I cannot stand here and refer you to the bank that the Lord wants you to be banking at, but do you know what the Lord wants involvement with that too? Even if it's just a $200 savings account, the Lord wants to tell you where you should be banking, whether it's for the teller's sake or it's for your sake. There is a bank that is going to give you the favor that no matter your credit score, no matter what your income, no matter how much you're asking for and what you want to accomplish, there is a bank that the Lord has preserved, prepared to receive you. He will get you financed because he wants you to have a positive budget. Find the bank. If it requires fasting and being on your face, carpet is comfortable, get down there. Okay? Restructuring. Help me to know you've got this. Ask me a question. Tell me something about restructuring. Feedback, comments. Down here, Caleb. Uh, yesterday, you, you helped out a lot for me when you're talking about just the, the mortgage and just breaking down those payments and how you can save on your interest uh, by um, paying the same amount but just dividing them into two every two weeks and making that payment. So that's part of the restructuring as well. Yep. Helps to save money. Or, yeah. Amen. Thank you. What's the largest pool of funding available if you restructure? What's the device? What's the vehicle? Second mortgage. Who in here has equity on their private home or second home? You fully own yours. Okay. Does everybody have two free hands? Come on. Great testimony right there. She owns her home. You know, she's in 7% of the population of America. 7%. Congratulations. All right, what about anybody else? You have equity in your own home? Yeah? I know I should be getting some hands in here, sure. Some of you have been established for a long time. All right, so if it's needed, that second equity line is there. But be advised here in the next quarter, which we're in the first quarter right now, the Fed meets quarterly. So come April, the Fed's going to come together again, and the Fed chair and our current, our current uh, White House do not see eye to eye in particular. We would have no more Fed rate hikes if it was up to the president. Um, they would be probably going the other direction if he had his way with our economy. Everything would be going the other way. And when I say everything, I mean everything would be going the other way if it was up to President Trump. The Deficit that we talked about of the 21 trillion, the state and local debts, they'd all be going the other way, towards back towards zero. The Fed is talking about doing four more rate hikes, a full percentage point. 
that if there is any opportunity for you to take variable rates and lock them into a fixed rate, this is your year. This is timely to be in here now because of taxes and because of Fed hikes, that if you're going to move, I told one individual in here, it gets dealt with this week. And when I said this week to this individual, I meant this week. That's part of taking your stand and becoming proactive. You don't give another inch. Don't give another month to interest. It's a beast. Get it off your back. So move everything to fixed as much as possible. Restructuring the refinance and the second mortgage and the personal loan. Um, if you want to go the route of personal loan, there are some really competitive rates. If you simply go online and type in personal loan, uh, the places that say they can approve you within an hour, be careful and yet take advantage. There are some good programs out there. And when they say approved within an hour and funds are wired within 24, they can be vicious in the fact that they're so easy. That all of a sudden, you get the funds, and they get misallocated, and now you're misplaced. But they are fast. And when they say 24-hour funding, I mean the next day, your balance is up. 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, and they'll max out your debt ratio. They'll push it right to the limit. And then if you miss, they're ruthless. OK? So use them wisely, but if that's the angle you want to go on a personal loan that the bank is just not, uh, doesn't sit with you, maybe you do everything online and you are completely in the clouds, maybe that's the angle you want to take if you don't like brick and mortar for the younger ones in this room. All right. Questions? Peace? I meant to go the other way. Question. I'm just giving him a hard time down there. Question here, Pastor yep. Steve. Listen. So um, for somebody, can you kind of break down somebody who wants to do a refinance because to me it can be extremely confusing. Um, and then how that helps your payment as well. If you, Like you said, you got equity in your house, but then you want to do a refinance because, mm -hmm. you know. Sure. The mortgage process, um, especially if you go back for a refinance, you're allowed to borrow up to 80% of your home. And don't you dare sell me that you're borrowing at 81%. Don't do it. Because then this thing, this nasty thing called PMI comes in, private mortgage insurance. Don't use it. Don't take advantage of it. Private mortgage insurance is law. They have to charge you private mortgage insurance if you borrow 81% of the equity of your home. And what that means is that the insurance you're paying is added to your monthly principal and interest payment every month, and they don't tell you when your loan is now at 80% of value or lower. They just let you keep paying it. Don't get into PMI. It's a nightmare, okay? So 80% of the value of your home, using easy numbers, if your home is worth $100,000, you're allowed to borrow up to $80,000. You've had your home for three or four years, or it was handed to you with a uh, ridiculous low price, and you've got equity in your home, you can take the difference of what you owe up to the $80,000 out of your home in a cash-out mortgage or a consolidation mortgage, but just call it a cash-out, where you're just going to go to the bank and tell them that you want to take a second mortgage out on a cash-out for the ex excess equity you've got in your home. So let's say you owe 50, the home is worth at 80%, 80, there's $30,000 that the bank will simply issue a check to Caleb for $30,000 minus some closing costs, which are anywhere between $1,000 and $1,500, depending on your bank. Now, once you have that money, it's up to you to allocate them to the proper places. Again, misallocations makes you misplaced. Puts you out of line with the will of God. If you're going to do this, do it wisely and only do it once. So now you've got your second mortgage. You take that money, you pay off your lower interest credit cards, your lowest interest loan accounts, and you close them. You get rid of them, get them out of your life, you're done with those. And you focus your payments on that first and the second mortgage at that time. What does the mortgage process actually include? We'll be going into the bank, filling out the application papers, filling out a personal financial statement, and then they will send an appraiser to your house if you haven't had one done in the previous year. They will do an appraisal on the house, and based on today's housing market, it should be higher than what you ever previously did because the housing market has been pretty strong in the last couple of years. So you're probably going to find a little more equity than what it appraised at when you first moved into your house. That's the number they'll use to judge the 80% of what you owe as to what the home value is actually worth. How's that? Wow. <laughs> we, we have an online question. Okay. Uh, so someone online is saying that they have a number of small debts. Uh, 
equaling about seven thousand dollars, they want to know if you would recommend consolidating those debts through their current bank. Absolutely. Okay. Because if it's revolving lines of credit, I'm assuming that you've got higher interest rates. I'm assuming that a fixed rate is going to do you a great favor with the interest payments you're making. And when you lower that monthly payment, if you've got three payments of $50 each, there's $150 a month going in on three small cards, $7,000. You consolidate that into a three-year term note and continue paying $150. You'll actually probably eliminate that note anywhere from eight to 13 months faster than if you just make the minimums without continuing to use the cards and occurring more interest. So absolutely, consolidate, get rid of them, keep one card for travel and emergencies, get rid of the other two, pay them off, no longer rely on credit cards, pay that note off as fast as possible, be debt free, rejoice in the Lord, and live free. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, they were wondering how, uh, personal loan or personal or loan? Okay. The personal loan is, is going to, collateralized loans are going to offer you a lower interest rate, but if it's a consolidation loan, there's no other debt and the income is there, the personal loan would be faster to get because a collateralized loan is going to require a transfer of lien holder on a title or the entire process of a mortgage and for $7,000 that just doesn't seem to be worth it. A personal loan should close for anywhere between $80 and $150 bank fees and be able to just simply the check handed to them or the bank themselves will write the checks to the credit cards for them and pay the balance off in full. If they just bring in the most recent statement, the debt's gone, the bank takes care of everything, and they get one new payment they can direct draw and pay extra principal on. This online thing is cool. I feel like I'm at Eagle Mountain. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> that's, that's more than 250. Anything else? We got a lot of ground to cover yet. What? I just had one quick question. Yeah. Online quick loans. Over a two-week period, I probably had seven offers. They, the, the form looks identical. They're all under a different name. How, how is that? Is it one large bank that's putting all those out? All these solicitations? No. There's a hundred. They're cropping up all over the place because people are so mm -hmm. desperate for money. They're so desperate that they take out an online loan, they pay off the other creditors that are harassing them, and they get those paid down, and they'll use these cards again that have been paid off and rack up more debt, and now they're looking for more money. All they're doing is transferring debt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're just moving debt around to different instruments. So no, the online companies, there's 100 of them. The brick and mortar ones, there's 100 of them. Plus there's all of our banking institutions. You have got abundance of places that will give you money for the right amount of interest. Yeah, they're tempting. Uh, our... Uh Credit score is fairly high in the upper sure. 700s. And I mean, their offers are like three and a quarter percent. Yeah, you and know. if you are in a situation where you do have these pesky, like these three that were online of three little loans or whatever you've got going mm -hmm. on, you are absolutely perfectly positioned to go and get a personal loan and get rid of those, put them all into one payment, max that payment out as high as it can go, be done. Absolutely, you're a prime candidate for that scenario. Thank you. Sure. This will be quick. I got a question. What if for, for somebody who has like, who wants to do the consolidation but has like credit cards and whatnot, but also like a, a vehicle loan or something of that nature? Yeah. Take care of the, the stuff that's a thorn. Deal with the stuff that's the minimum payments that are making your budget go negative, if that's the case, or get rid of, if you can get rid of minimum payments that are higher than the installment loan and at a lower interest rate, your money ahead. Your installment loan is at a lower interest rate with a lower monthly payment than the minimums you're paying off. If you can't accomplish that, don't restructure. Just start paying off the small balance. Okay. Am I saying that right? I think so. Yeah. Somebody else put it in their own words. You're holding the microphone. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. No. <laughs> well, no, I was wondering if they should consolidate it together so that way they get all paid off through like a personal loan or, or something like that. Would that be doable a good idea or just do it to pay off like the credit cards and then worry about the vehicle loan no that if the vehicle can be part of your minimums then include the vehicle with it and get your your vehicle free and clear it feels really good to drive around a clean title yeah that feels really good mm -hmm. congratulations uh get as much as you can on the consolidation but make sure the interest rate is lower and make sure that your payment is lower 
Those are the two advantages you're going to have for consolidating. And if borrowing limitations exist, pay off the credit cards, the revolving credit, and keep the collateralized lower interest rate loan you have on the vehicle and just pay that off separately according to the chart. Gotcha. Now okay. I'm tracking. Got it. There's an answer for everything. I am very willing to say I don't know. When you guys hit me with one, I'll tell you and I'll say I'll get back to you later. Uh, seriously, the questions are probably endless. Um, email me. This chart here. Is there anybody in here that is not understanding this chart? I am going to review it one more time. Is there a printout? Well, there's actually four slides. It just keeps going. If you're looking over here, it's, uh, yeah. There are people in this room that do get this chart that know numbers. In fact, I would imagine that Kyle back here would be one person in this room that probably has absorbed more of the information of what I've given out here than most in this room. That Kyle back here has got a head for numbers He's probably grasped the concept to a nice degree to the point that he could sit down with you and draw this chart up for you. If I'm giving you too much credit, stop me now. <laughs> I did it with my mom actually a week, last week before we moved in here. Like I said. Okay. <laughs> Sharp. <laughs> yeah. We have a meeting at some point. We'll get there, but the three of us, I, okay. So we do our restructuring. We've gotten rid of the pesky little ones, or maybe we haven't at all. We draw up a chart that looks like this. It starts with today's date, and it runs through until you're done. You list out what your debts are for exactly the amount of what your principal balance is owing. You put your minimum balance up here, and then you put any found money that you have. Let's talk about found money for a minute. That's part of our review at this point. Who has something they have identified that would be found money in their lives? It's been 48 hours. Back here. Holler it out. You're canceling a subscription. Yep, or I get it. All right. My first class I taught, I actually kept a spreadsheet where every week when somebody found money, there were seven families, seven households were represented, seven, seven separate addresses were represented in this class doing exactly what we're doing in here. And I had them list out every time they came, I said, I want the testimony of found money. Seven families. What was our balance at the end of our classwork as to what they had for found money? This includes the restructuring. This includes the sales. This includes suddenlies. What was the number? $27,842. If it was exactly that, <laughs> much too low. Another number? $87,000 during the class after I told them that we are children of the kingdom of God, that we should be expecting suddenlies, that we should be expecting phone calls, and we should be expecting the windows of heaven be opening up if you start tithing appropriately. This lady, this one particular lady comes up to me and says, you know what? I don't have any debt, but uh, I'm still interested in finding money. I'm like, okay, do you tithe? Well, I'm going to start. So she puts in her tithe. She gets a phone call. Before we had our next class again, she gets a phone call. There was an inheritance of $20,000 that had been sitting out there that she didn't know about. She got sent a check for $20,000, and she was already debt-free. The Lord just did it to say thank you for tithing. Increase back here. Someone online said they canceled subscriptions, lowered the phone bill, and looked at the car insurance policy. And? Is there a result of found money per month? Uh, they just said that, and maybe me saying this, maybe they'll write in. Maybe they'll write in. Yeah. See if they give us a net income total of what monthly they found for their budget after doing those adjustments. That number should be pretty impressive. The whole shopping car insurance might be longer than just a couple of days, but we'll see if they come back with something. I know one place people can find money is they need to check with their cell phone provider, and if you're an ex-veteran, a lot of phone companies give you 10% discount. Okay. Go online and look for lost money. I found some. I still not. Yeah. That, so did I a few months ago. I don't think I have that slide in here, but I actually have a handout that I left at home. It's back home. But I actually list all the websites you can go to where you can. Do you remember some of the URLs? Um, yeah. It's, uh, well, one is Coin Texas. 
Okay. Clay, I already checked, I think, for the Roberts. Um, but, oh! Yeah, there's like four uh, websites. Yeah, you can go to, um, can go or to if Google. you just Google yeah. lost money, lost there's money. actually one search engine that does it all for all 50 states. It is required, especially at the state and federal level, that if somebody has left you money, or if your name is on money, that for X number of years they have to make it publicly known that that money exists and that it belongs to you. So you go to these URLs back here. Yeah, uh, they, said, they said in just subscriptions alone, $100 per month is $100 added. a month. Yeah. How many of you would benefit with $100 a month? And all they did was give up subscriptions. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, whatever those subscriptions provided, the internet will give it back to you for free. Just do the most, the keystrokes. Congratulations. Thank you. This online thing also. This is, this is awesome. Okay, so the found money. Yes, thank you for bringing that up because I did fail to put a bullet down there. These find money websites, you put in your name or the name of a loved one I, and every form of your name, maiden name, any nicknames, use, I mean, if you were known as Bubba Smith when you were a kid, put in Bubba Smith. If that's the only way that somebody knew you, you put in every variation of your name and all the identifiers on these websites, and it will flat out tell you if you have money coming. And it's worked. There are testimonies of people that have found that in another state they haven't lived in in 40 years, there was money sitting there waiting for them. That's crazy. How much? I'm an administrator of my mother's estate, and so I was just, for fun, typed in my mother's name, and it came up in Alaska. Well, I've lived in Alaska, but my mother never did. She set up, oh, she set up a savings account in Minnesota, used my P.O. box in Alaska, and I got, um, I just found out yesterday that I'm getting $232. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Amen. So. That's first fruits. That's increase. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. Quick question. I thought that um, most of those, you know, sometimes you go to those sites and it's like, oh, we got to pay for a fee in this, so... Is a couple of them are fee based. A couple of them are. They should not be because they ask if, if they're fee based, don't go to them. Because no, every state, ones. every state by law has to have it Requiring. listed. And if it's usually yeah. a .org. Wherever you've had an address is what you're looking for. You had a question? Um, my wife and I lived in a two story with a walk up attic in a full basement and an attic over the two car garage. In Twenty by uh, twenty by eighteen shed in the yard, and um, through well, my, my wife passed about two and a half years ago, and then I had to move up here, and I was under pressure. But the stuff that we had accumulated, if I had had time to sell it all, I would I'd be doing pretty good, and, it, and a lot of it was. Well, there were some antiques and stuff yeah. like that, but there's just a lot of things that we just accumulated. So yeah. go through your house. Yeah, when people don't clean out their place and then you have to do the estate cleaning. Yeah, Don't be so quick to throw away those paintings when you read articles on how there's a classic behind a you know stick figure. So the found money in particular to this chart, that found money is like this individual that wrote in it online where it's found money on a monthly basis, subscriptions, that's the found money you're adding to this. The found money is a one, t one lump sum of money in the mail, money in the attic, money because you sold your, I was wondering if somebody in here was gonna say I sold my Firebird or something like that this morning. I was, I was waiting for it. Um, but this found money is what you find monthly. That whatever you find on a monthly basis that you're saving and no longer paying out of pocket, you were already paying that money out on a monthly basis. That money was already not yours because you were sending it to Time Magazine. Please don't do that. But anyway, um, yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry, liberal. <laughs> um, but that's what goes on here for the added money. And this is what starts your payment schedule off. Okay? And then once one is paid off, where does the money go? To the next one. To the next one. When that one's paid off, and how long is this individual in debt for once they start the program? 7.75 years, debt-free, no mortgage, no student loan, no debt. Done. The only thing that will interrupt this is if you do choose to use temporary debt or if you step off the plan. And you know what? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Just get back on. If you step off and do something foolish, repent, rewrite your plan, and start again. Okay? 
All right. Budgets, budget tools. Right after these slides, this slide I have not hit. So right after the charts. Capital bold letters, just a couple of one-liners here, and here's the prayer for revelation that I skipped on this slide. I just completely skipped this slide period until I was able to come back and finish up some other details. You must have a proper understanding of who God is, that he is good and his intention to you is always good. You need knowledge of who God is. I couldn't really say that in any other fashions than the way I rephrased the same thought three times in that sentence. Know God. If you need a moral of the story of this weekend and sum it up in one great big statement, know your God. Know him inside and out. Know him as your best friend. Know him as your provider, your El Shaddai, and everything else that he desires to be called in terms of adoration and endearment because he deserves it. The Bible is God's word, his testimony, his love letter to you. Every answer to life is found in it. Don't ever discount a situation you may face where the answer doesn't already exist in the Holy Spirit and in the Word of God. Nothing is too small. And then the prayer for revelation. <sighs> How are we doing? Good. Anybody interested in this stuff? Wow, taxes. Do we need a break? Go ahead. Yeah, please. I need a break. I will say this. Um, my wife and I, when we took over as, I know it's coming. I know it's coming. My wife and I, when we took over this church, um, we had um, pretty much, you know, gotten to the point where we got very little in return, you know, because our kids were grown, uh, that kind of thing. And so, but since we took over the church, uh, all but one year, maybe two, make sure I can, maybe two, we have owed taxes. The Affordable Care Act hit us hard, and it has grown over the, over the period of time. So over six years, for the last six years, we have been in a deficit where we've had to repay the government. And I've gone to a couple different tax, I've switched, Specials. one person recommended a lawyer, uh, tax person that didn't really work. I went to another one because I typically up to that point I've been doing my own taxes. So now we we have this tax debt that's there that seems to be growing exponentially. And so, I mean, beyond a tax lawyer, a CPA, you know, there's got to be a resolution to this. So I, I don't know what what you can offer. I may not be the only one, but certainly that Affordable Care Act has definitely hit us pretty hard. <clears throat> Let me get through these slides. Yeah. And if you don't get a couple of answers to these slides, okay. it's a private conversation. Okay? When you've already gotten into that point and we're looking at ministers and we're looking at the write off for a nonprofit, I would really like to talk to you privately on that. There are so many write offs that are available to our clergy and nonprofits that I would want to make sure you're taking advantage of. Okay? All right. <clears throat> Trivia. Everybody likes trivia. How about when some of us, not these young folk in here, but remember Trivial Pursuit? Yeah. Remember sitting around the table getting so angry at your family members in Trivial Pursuit? I, yeah, there was always one person at the table that should have known Alex Trebek, hey? Gotten involved in Jeopardy? How about some of this trivia? The government in the U.S. collects about $3.7 trillion in a year in income and payroll taxes alone. $3.7 trillion in just your payroll taxes. Income tax is where government collects the most tax. In federal, state, and local income tax, they'll collect $2.4 trillion in 2019. So that is more specific to just the income tax. That's more business. Okay. On average, 40% of a family's income is required to pay taxes. 40%. Now, let me qualify that number of the 40%. Can you repeat that stat, please? Yeah, that on average, 40% of a family's income goes to pay taxes. 
But now let me break that down. That 40% is what the IRS code requires, the way it's written. But then they gave us these bones called deductions and credits. So the 40% is if you just simply throw in the towel and say, you know what, Mr. IRS, I don't want to really file my taxes, so here's my gross income and here's my money. The game, as it's called, the game is to see how much of that 40% you can put back in your own pocket. So um, if you know how to play the game and you listen to some of the wisdom on these slides, and especially if you're self-employed, you should probably never really ever pay taxes again. There are enough deductions and ways to do taxes that when they say that the 10 richest pay 80% of the taxes, it sounds a lot like the church. 10% of your people pay for 80% of the tithes. It's not that the tax are super taxed, that the rich are super taxed. It's rather that they just cannot take advantage of enough credits to wipe out their income tax. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when you have individuals that are saying they want to put an 8% tax on the rich, that is backwards from the way it is right now. It's not that there is already this huge taxation on big corporations and big money. They just simply have enough coming in that the IRS doesn't have any other credits or deducts for them to use. If your income is, I'm just going to say, less than $250,000 a year, you can cover a lot of territory of that 40%. Okay? There are 774,000 uh, dollars words in the King James Bible. In 2012, the U.S. tax code had 4 million. 770,000 words in the Bible that we treasure and has got all the wisdom of life in it. But to just pay taxes, we need 4 million words. And then to top that one off, the U.S. tax code was changed or edited 4,680 times in a 12-year period between 01 and 12. No wonder they can't keep up. Money Magazine did a uh, survey on the IRS back in about the same time frame. And what came out of that survey with Money Magazine was just astonishing. They sent the same income, the same Schedule 1040 to like 50 different CPAs in the state of California and not any two of the returns matched. None of them, 50 of them. In fact, not only did they not match, but the amount of money that this particular income or, or 1040 required ranged between $2,000 and like $18,000. There was that much of a span in what the tax owed was on this particular filing. Tax owed. Or tax owed. Tax owed. I mean, they, they just fabricated numbers and sent it to 50 CPAs saying, please file my taxes. Question on that. Was that on account of they had it, their pre printed uh, deduction thing and so on that they just read the numbers off on, or do you know? That, well, I don't know how they submitted the forms and the information into the different CPAs, but there are required forms that they would have to submit in order to file taxes. They, oh, they would have gotten all the same information as what the point was of the study. It was called the IRS test. And you can look it up online. It's all there. And I'm not going to sit here and repeat the facts of the IRS test because it is, it is pretty negative. But I've been in business now for 10 years, and I have called the IRS a number of times because of my own error, or because of their error, or because of a garnishment, or because of this, that, and the next thing, I was late in a filing. In 10 years, and as much communication as I've had with the IRS, I don't have a single negative thing to even think, let alone say. All of my interaction has been very pleasant, it's been very professional, and they are so helpful. They are so helpful. So the IRS is an entity where you will hear People say that it's illegal, the IRS shouldn't even exist, but because of the way people have manipulated the law of America, that that's where they came from. I'm not going to go there with you. Pay unto Caesar what's Caesar's. Okay? But if you can get out of paying something to Caesar, let's show you how to do it. Yeah. The IRS audited me because of my filing. 
and dealt with the amount of taxes and obeying the law. And I went downtown in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. The IRS agent didn't know what I knew. And ended up, I guess they watch or something in the audit. The person who was auditing me, all of a sudden something, a light flashed or something. And she said, excuse me, I've got to, I'll be right back. She went out and she came back in crying. And she said, okay, uh, Reverend Roberts, you're good. We're going to let you go. I said, well, what's the deal? She said, well, we got to reclassify you as a volunteer uh, at the ministry. You're not getting paid by the ministry. What you're doing is volunteer work. And uh, so I said, so what's the deal? She said, you don't owe taxes. You don't even have to file. Now, fast forward, that was 2005 to 2000 and, no, I take it back. It was 95, okay, to 2005. Uh, I filed bankruptcy, and uh, the IRS agent showed up at the bankruptcy court, and uh, they said, well, we're after the judge uh, gave us a plan to restart or whatever, we didn't want to let everything go, we were trying to still pay, and uh, they said, we're, we want to audit you. I said, I've already been audited, you know, I'm a volunteer. She, they said, who told you that? I said, you all did. They said, well... We've seen you haven't filed for the last three years. I said, you told me not to. They said, well, we want you to file again. So the Holy Spirit said, ask them this. If I file and I don't owe anything, but you all owe me, will you pay me? And uh, they said, yeah, we would pay if you have a return coming back. I said, okay, that's fine. We filed and got $16,000 back to us. I hadn't filed at all, and they were keep, that was the money they were keeping. But when we filed... We ended up getting sixteen thousand dollars for the, and they said if we if we if we had known we could have got it back for the years prior to that, right. but they only gave us back three years. Back three years. You can yeah. only go back three years. So, We're getting to that. You can only back yeah. three years. <laughs> so, the discrepancies, and that's between two IRS agents. The discrepancies that exist even between the two, it just confirms what I'm telling you. Okay. Um, Taxes are a large, large loss area in people's lives, and it's just simply because they don't understand. Okay. There's been some tax reform, and I do have, I told you. Can any of you picture what the old 1040 looked like? Okay. We have gone from 79 lines down to 23, and the 1040A and the 1040EZ are both now eliminated. You can't file them anymore. So the 1040A used to look like this. That should be a very familiar form to all of you. It doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. 79 lines gone. We have now gone to the postcards. Do you remember the big promotion when they were trying to pass the law of tax reform? They were advertising that it's going to go to a postcard. They didn't quite make the postcard, but I would say they did a pretty bang-up job. It's a half a sheet of paper. The whole thing could actually fit on one sheet, and why they separated it, I don't know. That all your identifiers are here, and then your actual tax filing is here. Now, in order to get to this size, they're still going to gather the same information, but they're doing it on what's called a Schedule 1 or a Schedule 2 through 6. 1 through 6 is where they're getting the information. So now so, so, uh, Schedule C, what used to be Schedule C for self-employment, is now a Schedule 1 for other income. So they have simplified things, and yet it still is maybe an imperfect system, because they'll have fields on the forms and the schedules that say basically to be determined. Um, that they're just reserving that space for reform when they realize that these forms are not perfected yet. I've got 10 minutes. No, I think we gave you more. Oh, come on. Give me your hour. Whew. I didn't realize it was it's 10 to 3. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Um, the standard deduction, everybody is familiar with what a standard deduction is. It's now married, it's at 24,000. For single, it's at 12. They didn't do any favors for married folk, even though scripturally we're gonna be married. Um, it's just simply double the single. And it's very simple. Uh, it used to be different, the two of them. Uh, but those are up significantly higher. So your first $24,000 of income as a married couple is tax-free. You don't pay taxes on it. That's your standard deduction now. Now, this next line is the CPA versus the tax preparer. The fees that are charged do not necessarily relate to the accuracy. The fees that you're paying for your tax filing is not necessarily related to the accuracy. 
TurboTax can be extremely, extremely effective for a simple W-2, okay? Home ownership, car ownership, W-2, child care, health, that's all TurboTax and it's all clean. It really is clean. But once you go beyond just a W-2 and you want to start filing schedules and you want to get into the child tax credit and things like that, you can leave a lot of money on the table if you rely on software or what I would refer to as the industry terminology of a tax preparer. The tax preparer is the one that's sitting at a table in Walmart and it's what they do for two months for some side income and then they go back to dog grooming or whatever their actual occupation is, okay? As opposed to a CPA that may charge you $110 to $150 an hour in the big city, it could be as high as $300 an hour, their fee may not necessarily relate to their accuracy. In fact, they say that if you're a successful self-employed individual, you should go to two separate CPAs and go with the best option. That's the recommendation. Pay the fees because the return is going to pay for both fees and you're gonna still put money in your own pocket. That's just wisdom from the street. It's up to you how you wanna handle it. There may be nobody in this room whatsoever that's in a situation where they need to be going to two CPAs. But increase is coming and just be prepared with the wisdom. Amen? Okay, W4. And they do it gratis. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Question. Yep. You're talking about turbo. You're talking about turbo tax, and I'm still not there. Talking about turbo tax and what you have that you can file through turbo tax. <laughs> what about these big corporations where they have all your retirement? You have your HSAs. You have a house. You have a trailer, car. Can you do that through TurboTax, or do I stick with my CPA? You can do that through TurboTax, but if you've already just declared ownership of a CPA, continue to use them. You've got enough going on that there would be a lot of opportunity to miss something or to make a mistake. And taxes, I'm telling you, taxes are powerful if you use them to your advantage. Stop looking at taxes as being a great big liability. Look at taxes as being opportunity. Treat it with respect. Seek wisdom in the counsel of many and see what happens, okay? The W-4 is probably one of the biggest mistakes that corporate America, or Americans, I should say, payroll Americans, make. They go in and they, I guess I gave a small example of that, of I'm not able to save and so I'm gonna file a zero. Now with what you know about interest, does that make any sense at all? $4,000 of withholding and the government's gonna hold it until March 15th? and you get it once back, my response to that, as I told you, is you're already irresponsible with money. Why bother? <laughs> so pay the taxes that are due. Um, and I put right in here, IRS reputation, there's no reason to be afraid of them. There really isn't. They will work for you. They've got correction and amendment forms that you can file going back three years. They will work with you. They've got forgiveness forms where you can ask once, <laughs> The forgiveness forms for penalties are filed after you fully paid the penalty, just so you're aware of that. It may sound a little bit backwards, but once your penalty and your interest for failed filings has been paid in full, now you can file the Form 940X and actually ask for a refund of all of that money. And I hear it's a pretty good success rate. Three years. You're able to amend tax returns going back three years. The W-4, um, again, the federal government doesn't pay interest. I don't have the, I've, I've covered this. Itemizing versus standard deduction. And then self-employed, we've hit really hard. The item, standard deduction, I'm gonna move you to the back of the room. Um, <laughs> okay, where was I? Itemizing and standard. Itemizing used to be really, really powerful. If you had health bills, if you had a lot of expenses that you were allowed to write off on your tax, especially if you were not self-employed, very powerful, especially with medical bills. However, with the higher standard deductions, that's going to be, in fact, the, the logic behind the shorter form in raising the standard deduction is that fewer Americans itemize. 
because it's very expensive to itemize. You really do need an accountant. You need a professional, and you need to gather up all of your receipts so that you can prove the expenses, and then you need to figure out what all your percentages is of each bucket that's available on the itemization list, on the deduction list, and then you actually file your taxes, trying to knock off that income. With the higher standard deduction, more people are going to find the standard deduction is just going to be a plug number, the receipts can stay in the drawer, and you move forward. So that's the difference between the itemizing and the standard. The itemizing is kind of being phased out for a lot of people. All right? And I do believe that ends taxes, I would be into insurance, and I could also just be done. So. Is it bad that they are reducing itemizing, like, for any in individual, like? Is it a bad thing? Yes. If you're already getting the deduction through a plug number, I don't mm -hmm. see any harm in it. Okay. It's saving you a whole lot of work to not have to itemize. You're still going to be able to do student loans. You're still going to be able, in some states, to do all of your car registration. There are still deductions that they are allowing. But the longer form for itemizing that was so laborious to fill in because of all of the individual transactions having to be categorized by bucket and then added up and put into there, and then you're still only allowed a percentage of that number, that's what they're trying to phase out. And I, I, I got to believe that the timing, when the IRS puts in their booklet, figure 18.7 hours to complete this form, that number had to have come down this year with the way that the tax reform has occurred here. And as for Obamacare, my understanding is such that that is officially done. That there is no more penalizing an American for not having an insurance in Obamacare. The fees have been eliminated. There is no more penalty. I was a holdout by principle of a socialistic law of forcing insurance on me where I simply took the penalty and then found deductions to write it off. I still received it. I... <laughs> No, I, uh, I, I, I had an individual that say that's just rebellious. Why not take advantage of the system? They just don't know what I knew. I still received the information, the paperwork, saying that I had insurance. So. Now, well, if you're employed and you have insurance, Obamacare never even affected you. It affected your employer, but not you. So, Wait, but so Obamacare fees are done. I'm sorry. Are you speaking to? You're speaking to the the penal. You're penalized if you don't have health care. And that penalization is now over? Done. Yes. Yep. Gone. Period. Cannot charge you anymore. Praise the Lord. Yep. 